All right, the next speaker in our session is Colin Davishin, who is the monitoring coordinator for the Montana Dakotas Bureau of Land Management, where he focuses on data collection and management. Please help me welcome Colin. Okay, um, so I'm gonna start off talking about uh, uh, AIM data and data collection. And uh, I just want to acknowledge the other people that helped me a lot um, in developing these techniques and pushing it for forward, Jennifer Walker and Doug Browning. So I'm going to start off here kind of through this fun slide in here uh, as a joke, but it's important for me uh, to, to uh, point out to you guys that in the last talk, we heard about Dr. Jones is uh, working on the, creating those uh, land scale maps and also on how the RAP tool works. And it's important to me to, to point out that the functionality of the RAP, along with many of the other state transition models and tools that you, you hear, comes from the fact that all of those models, they need one thing in common, and that is data. And, and they need good data because it doesn't matter how smart those people that you have heard from and you're going to hear from are, if the data that they start out with isn't good, the end result will not be good. And so to me, data collection is absolutely, and the management and storage of it is, is the start of formulating something that's workable for everyone. And so in the talk, you heard 30,000 data points to start out with. We're closer to 50,000 than we are 30,000 with NRI and AIM data. And so we need to get that data into the hands of the people who need to use it. And so I'm going to refer to the RAP tool as the beast just because I think of these beasts as out there eating up this data and needing it to survive. Okay, So it's my job then to, to provide that food for them. Okay, And what do these beasts eat? Well, they eat rangeland data, so we need to supply them with rangeland data. And so the um, Bureau of Land Management has the AIM data, and then the Natural Resource Conservation Service has NRI and LMF data. And basically, the only thing that you really need to know about those data sets is that they are a standard data set that is collected using um, very stringent methodologies and that... Um, they are essentially the same even though they're collected from different organizations. And so when I say standard methodologies, basically it's the core methodologies um, for collecting that data that many of you are familiar with if you've ever done any kind of um, range data collection. So things like bare ground, um, uh, your canopies, your uh, species inventories. So these are very common methodologies, um, and, but done in a standardized fashion. So now, when I was hired by the BLM, um, and they brought me in and they said, okay, um, you need to fix our data collection and management um, problems that we're having. And I said, okay, well, that, that's fine. You know, where are all these data sets? I'd like to see, you know, some examples. And down here at the left, you see what basically I was shown was that most of the data sets at the BLM, and, and I'm not just going to pick on the BLM here. I've worked for several federal agencies. This is not uncommon. We have a problem that even though technology advanced to the, to the point where we're using these satellites, it is hard as hell to pry a pencil and a data sheet out of your average range con or field biologist's hands. They just don't want to give it up. They're terrified. They, it's like they, they understand they use their smartphone every day, but there, there's fear, okay? And so because of that, a number of things were happening. Those data were being collected, and in most cases, it was a one-and-done type situation. In other words, they would collect the data on their data sheet, they would use it for whatever they had to roll that up to in their minds, and then they'd stuff that data back into a drawer, never to be seen again. Okay, And so we really needed to get away from that type of management and get into uh, uh, what I would call the modern day era of collecting and managing that data. And so I broke it down into what my job was, and it was to, to get quality data and to ensure its collection so that we had that food to push up to the, to the beast and very similar things, right? Supplying the data when needed. This is a major issue that people don't think about, but we all nowadays expect data and expect answers at a minute, in, in seconds, right? If you pick up your phone and you tell Siri, get me this, and she gives you anything but what you want, you're just angry, right? You're just like stupid Siri, and you just like slam it down, like start pounding on your thing. You know, like 
That's how we've become. Yet, for some reason, when it comes to our scientific data, we're okay with lags of one year, three years. I mean, is that really acceptable? I, I don't think it is. How about access issues to, to those data, okay? It amazes me, like, in this day and age, but we have a number of, of, of range specialists and wildlife and so on that the only way that they can really process data is seeing it in a very specific way to them personally. And what I mean by that is some people are very comfortable with an Excel spreadsheet. Some people are very comfortable with seeing it spatially in a geo database. But there is not one thing that, that I can think of where if people want to see data, I can deliver to them where everybody is happy with it. So we'll talk about that. And then animal care and use is, in my, my mind, just a joke about you know, like how we handle our, our people and, and, the, and how they interact with the stuff. So we'll keep going here. So, so what are we doing to adapt to this? Well, when I got there, I said, you know what? We need to, to switch over our data collection to Survey 1, 2, 3. And the reason that I did that is because Survey 1, 2, 3 provides us with a, a number of things that are absolutely crucial to solving this problem. Um, data collection can be done on iOS and Android, which is a big thing. We were still using a lot of Microsoft-based tablets. They were big. They were heavy. They were paperweights. Um, they were archaic, all right? Every 20 to 22-year-old that you find right now to hire, which is what most of us hire when it comes to data collection, they've been using iPhones and, and iOS products since before puberty. It's as natural to them as brushing their teeth. You know, it's only us that struggle to switch between devices and everything else. For them, it's completely easy. So we needed to give them something that they could use, okay? So we get that easy data entry. These devices, super cheap. We can get them from even as little as $100. So when you start talking about before, you had these expensive field tablets and everything. People guarded them like they were babies, right? Now, you know, they're worth $200. And in a lot of projects, if it makes it one field season for $200, I'd say that's fantastic. All right? Uh, data uploads with Wi-Fi but works offline. So when you are working in remote Montana or whatever state you're in, you're not going to be online all the time. So these devices allow you to work offline, but then once you hit a cell phone signal, all that data is uploaded into the cloud and now available to other people. You can build an infinite amount of QA, QC into the data forms which is very important to get rid of errors while they're happening so that if somebody enters something that isn't right, there's a prompt, it tells them, they can correct it, we can go from there. We'll talk about how that data is instantly analyzed and how it can be shared in multiple formats coming up. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on what we built exactly, but I just want to show you real quick an example here. So on your phone, you have just a survey one, two, three, and collector little app icons that most of you are familiar with. So this is just my personal phone here that I'm showing you a couple of screenshots of. And you go to the next thing, and so you click on survey one, two, three, and now all the surveys that you built show up in survey one, two, three. Okay? Now, why is that important? I want, I want to get wildlife biologists and, and range staff away from the concept of carrying our little yellow right in the rain books that we all defend with our life, okay? And there are benefits to having those books, but I've also watched people spend two hours trying to go through their books because they've scribbled onto every different page, every different corner, trying to maximize. Here you see that you can carry not just all the AIM forms, but here I've built bumblebee forms, I've got um, LEC forms, I've got um, the uh, rangeland health forms. All those forms, everything that I could ever do in the field, everything that you could ever do in the field, whether you're biologist, range, whatnot, can be carried on the same device. So if you're, it used to be if you're out there collecting one thing and an opportunity presented itself, you'd write down in your book, oh, we you know, saw this and we had the opportunity, so we did this, right? But you didn't have the forms, you didn't have a database. Now, all of that, all of those forms are at the click of a button so that you can enter anything that you would possibly collect while out there. So it maximizes the time people have in the field. So here we just click on the AIM form and it says collect. And that's as simple as it is. You hit collect and you are right into the form and the, 
Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about them, but you can put up lookup lists. You can have drop downs of e anything and everything, and you can make those forms as bulletproof error wise as you could possibly imagine. So now we talk about you're out in the field and you just collected data on that form, all right? The second you return to the office, so picture yourself driving back from collecting data. Your data uploaded to Wi-Fi. When you get back to the office, you enter Survey123 on your computer, ArcGIS, okay? And now you pull up your data on that form and you can see spatially all the points that have been collected, not just by you, but everybody collecting that same data anywhere that you've shared it. Sorry for that feedback. The other thing is you can see that data in a tabular form. So some people, I found, need this spatial component, and it's really nice, especially if you get a data flyer that ends up out in Idaho, you know right away something happened that went wrong, and you can correct that, okay? But you can also click on any row of the tabular data by highlighting a point, it'll give you that, and you can print that out. So now we talk about sharing that data. So you get there, you look at it, it looks good. All you have to do is click on the export button up here and it gives you a list of all the ways that you can export that data. I like to work with R, okay? And so for me, it's super easy. I just um, put out a CSV and write, read it right into R and away I go, okay? But there you can have it in an Excel, you can have it in a shapefile, a geodatabase. Every type of data that you can think of, like I said, that people really work with today is available right, with, right there for you. Now, I, I mentioned that it analyzes the data for you too. So Survey123 under that same tab, here's that same form, I just happened to be a, grab a Bumblebee form. Every single question within that um, form that you put out is instantly analyzed by Survey123. And so here I just looked at a simple question, like what was the daily temperature when the surveys were, were done? And down at the bottom here, you, there were 51 surveys, and it gives you just quick minimum, maximum averages and sums of those. Now, is this land, or is this earth shattering? Absolutely not. But 99% of my wildlife biologists, when they go out to co collect sage grouse data, they're interested in how many males they had per lek in their whole area. So for them, without even doing anything, they literally just went out and collected data, hit upload, came back, and there's their answer. And they could track that throughout the season. So again, you know, a, a good way of seeing how that, that data moves. Now, under handling the people aspect of it, you set your groups to who you want to be able to collect data. You can set people as they can enter data, they can view data. You set all of that stuff so that you control who does everything. This stops people from messing up data. It allows people that need to see data but don't need to be entering data to, to, to look at some of those same things. So again, you control everything, which is very important. So Survey123 on, uh, on its own is an amazing uh, uh, thing to use when you're trying to ensure good field data is collected. I went a little step further, which is we combined it with collector, okay? And I'm gonna show you why that is. It's a little bit different here, but so going back here, we're going to hit that collector app icon, and now we're gonna select a map instead of a, a specific form. And what that map is, is a feature service that has already been built. So if you already know before your season starts what areas you're gonna go out and collect data in, what points, you can build that feature service and then you can utilize that feature service. So now over here on the right, you see a map of all of the aim points for Montana Dakotas from this last year, from 2018. So before our people even stepped into the field, they had a map that had every single point in it. The reason they're different colors is because a bunch of those were done. Once they, they are done, they turn red. Okay, so they start off green. Once we finish them, they turn red, it shows you where I was looking at this in the Billings field office. And so if I went into one of those points and I highlighted it, it would tell me the point name and what location it is. And then from there, if I click on that, I can launch every data form that I wanted them to collect at that site. 
So here, remember, we just launched that gap form before. Here's the gap. All of these are in here. So this is super important because now you're not leaving it to some 20-somethings that are out in the field to make sure they collect everything. You are telling them ahead of time you will collect all of these things. And so if you click on that gap form, not only does it bring up that same form that we looked at before, but now it's filling in all the information that you already told it to. Less information for your people to fill out in the field, less chance of errors and mistake, better quality data. Okay, so what does all this mean? Well, my technicians around the state said that I was the eye of Sauron last year because what would happen is as that data was collected, I could see it. I can see the colors change. I know where they're at. I know they're getting back to the office because I can see those colors changing. I know the data just hit and now it's coming up. But the big thing is now I can correct those errors in the data and the methodology. How many people in here have seen where a crew goes out and they start the year and they're collecting data, right? And maybe you went through and did some training with them, and you did the best you could with the little time that you had, right? And then at the end of the year, you get that data set, and you start to go through it. And then the very first week, you see a bunch of errors. And you're like, crap, I should have done a better job. It's my fault. It's not their fault. It's my fault. But then as you go through that whole field season, those same errors occur every single week because nobody ever had the time to go through and show them what was wrong. By doing this, I'm able to see those errors right away, contact that crew leader and that crew and say, listen, I think you guys didn't quite understand what you were supposed to be doing. This needs to be this, this needs to be that. And guess what? Those errors don't happen again then for the rest of the field season. So by staying on it, by putting in your time in that first week or so, you are able to um, make sure that data is in great shape. The data is uploaded and then you can protect it. You can move it into whatever server or data file you want once it's on, uploaded, plus it stays on the device, okay? Um, data is available for almost immediate use. I can run our scripts on that data when it comes in and correct everything and have it back out and functioning just like that. So now when you have other disciplines that want to see that data, say you, like for us BLM, we may have fuels and fire, we may have range, we have wildlife going on, we have NEPA stuff that needs done. That data can be shared and delivered in days or at the most weeks. So instead of years, we're talking about days and weeks. So also, I'll just show, show you real quick because I'm running low on time here. Each one of those forms is essentially um, uh, a, a layer that you can then add to a map. So because of that, this is just ArcGIS Online, Survey123 collects right to ArcGIS Online. So all those feature services, which is what each form is, you just click and add and you can put everything in one map Go right up here to the top, save that as a web app, and share it with anybody. So within five minutes, I can deliver whatever data sets are needed to the entire states of North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana in five minutes, not even. And it's easy to use. So why is all this data time important? Well, with these transitional models and with things like the, the beast out here, the wrap tool, to me, it's important that we get this data into the hands of people with bigger brains than me that really can take it to the next level. So I look at myself as a very important cog in that I'm going to make sure to get that data clean, in good shape, and available quickly. Not just for the people that I represent with the BLM, but for those that have the ability to take it to the next level and, and get it out to everybody public ranchers, everyone that wants to see it, okay? And so I'm going to shovel that AIM data into the beast as fast as I can get it. I'm just going to keep making that quality stuff. And so it's important to me that we continue to collect this AIM and NRI data because of the fact that um, uh, it, it is right now, to my knowledge, the largest uh, complete data set that we have for vegetation data in the world. 
And using that in combination with the things like uh, the RAP tool, make that data very usable to the general public as well as the scientists. And so as I travel around um, to my different field offices training people, the, 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 the comment I always hear from them the most is, Can, just make it easier. Just make it easier. Well, you've seen what we've done here, and you can't make data collection any easier than that. The RAP then takes that data and translates it for all of us to see. And you can't get any better than that until I accomplish my mission of developing one button to rule them all. So that's it.